Hey, Wild Thing fans! I'm back with some good news. First up, there's a second season of Wild Thing coming in September. It won't be Bigfoot this time, but I'm pretty sure it's something you'll find just as interesting. I'll be telling you more about it in the next few weeks. Keep an eye on the Wild Thing podcast feed and on the Wild Thing social media feeds. Look for at Wild Thing Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also sign up for the Wild Thing mailing list. Go to wildthingpodcast.com and submit your email. I promise I don't spam. Okay, second piece of news. So when Wild Thing came out, I received a lot of letters. Tons of you said that your kids loved the show, and many of you asked if there was a kids' version. I'm here to let you know that your wish has been granted. Introducing Searching for Wild Thing, a kid-friendly version of Wild Thing made in collaboration with Pinna. What is Pinna, you ask? It's an ad-free, kid-safe certified audio streaming service developed exclusively for kids ages 3 through 12. Searching for Wild Thing is a 10-part series, and the first episode is out today. You can hear that episode on the Wild Thing podcast feed on Apple, on Spotify, or wherever you listen. And if you like what you hear, you can subscribe to the whole 10-episode season through Pinna. New episodes are out every Friday. Just go to pinna.fm and sign up to hear the whole season, plus tons of other podcasts, audiobooks, and more, including other Pinna Originals podcasts, all expertly curated and developed for kids ages 3 through 12. And now, without further ado, the first episode of Searching for Wild Thing. On a road trip with his family, late at night in California Sierra Nevada mountains, Hal Halderman saw something. As we come around through an S-turn, we lit this thing up that was standing under a tree right on the edge of a road. The creature was taller than the van. Taller than the van. Well over seven feet tall, he thought, and absolutely gigantic. Massive, massive upper body. Big, huge triceps hanging down off the arms. It was very light colored. It was almost, almost white, but kind of an off-white, kind of dirty, maybe gray, light gray. He shot right past it before slamming on the brakes, bringing his giant van to a standstill. I said to my wife, I said, do you see that? And she goes, yes. And I said, I got to go back. And so when I started to throw it into reverse, she freaked out and started screaming and clawing on me and wouldn't let me go back. The sound of her panic woke their three little kids who were sleeping in the back seat. What was it, Dad? What was it? And I said, I think we just saw a Bigfoot. Go back, go back, go back. And my wife's just crazy screaming. No way, we're going back. And I didn't go back. And that's mostly that's mostly what eats at me. I want to see it again. We're about to embark on a journey looking for signs of the unknown. For a creature that I'm betting all of you have heard about, but aren't sure if it actually exists. Bigfoot. Uh-huh. That's right, Bigfoot. My name is Zoe, and with the help of my friend Aster, Hi. we're going to investigate and prove that Bigfoot exists. Um, well, I'm not so sure Bigfoot exists. Wait, what? Aster! Don't get me wrong, I love Bigfoot. I even had a Bigfoot vs. Yeti boxing match t-shirt when I was little. I've always believed in Bigfoot and still do. I've seen some evidence that shows that he could be real. Photos, footprints, videos. Um... What I've seen doesn't seem that believable. I mean, photos and footprints and videos can be and have been faked until you find evidence that we can prove is real. I'm skeptical. Well, good thing we have a podcast about it. Now we can get to the bottom of this mystery. Searching for a wild thing. On this podcast, we're going to be talking to eyewitnesses and Bigfoot researchers who will help show us that Bigfoot is real. Hold on. We're also going to be talking to scientists and examining DNA to prove that he's not real. Huh, we'll see about that. Until recently, Bigfoot was just a piece of American folklore to me. A spooky story to tell around the campfire. And then there was a bump in the night. <gasps> uh, what was that? I mean, people love strange and weird creature stories like that. But am I really supposed to believe that Bigfoot is real? All those tales? That's like saying the Loch Ness Monster is real, too. Um, he might be real. Um, really? Until recently, I didn't realize people took this stuff seriously, including Bigfoot. Well, let's just start with the most obvious question. What is Bigfoot? Bigfoot. 
It is in these vast, unexplored wilderness areas of North America that a nine-foot-tall, human-like creature is reported to live. This is the home of the Bigfoot. Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, as he's called in Canada, is a giant, hair-covered, human-like creature that's been reported more and more throughout the mountains of the northwestern United States and Canada. How big do they run? Many sightings have revealed this creature to be between seven to nine feet tall and 600 to 900 pounds. All I know is that if Bigfoot looks anything like that, my hiking trip would be put to a very quick stop. Once we started to dig into our research, I realized there was a surprising amount of stuff out there about Bigfoot. Documentaries, pictures, books, movies, and even merchandise. And of course, the famous 1967 footage. In the Patterson-Gimlin footage, you see a figure. Tall, hairy, you can't exactly make out who it is, but you know one thing, it's humanoid. And turns out, that Bigfoot has a name. It's Patty, and it is a she? I didn't know Bigfoot was a lady. What we're trying to tell you is that there's so much to learn about Bigfoot. I mean, the subject is a real rabbit hole. And a deep one at that. So many people have been looking into this stuff for decades, even before we were born. This is passed on for generations, and people keep searching their whole lives. So let's talk to journalist Laura Krantz, who has talked to many of these researchers. She's the reason we're doing this show, since she has her own podcast called Wild Thing. She created it after learning she's the distant cousin of famous Bigfoot investigator and scientist Grover Krantz. So, we gave Laura a call. How did Dr. Krantz get interested in Bigfoot? So Dr. Krantz, and this is my grandfather's cousin, he didn't think Bigfoot was real for the earlier part of his career. And then when he was working at Washington State University, somebody showed him some plaster casts of footprints. And one of the feet was kind of lamed or crippled looking. And Dr. Krantz was a physical anthropologist, which means he's an expert on footprints and how people walk. And he looked at these footprints and he's like, there's no way that somebody could have faked that. So at this point, he thought, this is the real deal. The design of the foot was for a creature that was about eight feet tall and heavy, and these were big feet. And he thought that if somebody had faked them, they would have had to have been an expert at anatomy and better than him at anthropology. So he thought, okay, I think this might be real. I think Bigfoot might be real. That's really cool. How do you think your cousin, Dr. Krantz, was treated by his scientific colleagues for researching Bigfoot and believing he could be real? I think he took a lot of heat for that. You know, he was trying to get a promotion at his job as a professor, and it made that a little more difficult. And Grover, well, he kind of suffered for it. But he really thought it was the real deal, and he didn't really care what people thought. He wanted to pursue this, and he wanted to find out what was going on. Do scientists still think that way about his work? Do they still think that it's nonsense or it was a waste of time? Most scientists to this day don't think Bigfoot is real. There are a handful. There's Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who's at Idaho State University, and there are a couple of others. But I would say that the majority of scientists, especially because now we do have DNA analysis and we have that tool, they're less likely to think that Bigfoot is out there. But there are a few of them who are open to the idea. They say, if you bring me a piece of evidence and it shows that there is a new ape species that we have never seen before, I'm willing to consider the idea that it might be Bigfoot. So there's some open-minded people out there who are willing to just see what the evidence brings them. Yeah, it's nice to keep an open mind. Yeah. What was Dr. Krantz's scientific approach? Yeah, so he would go out in the forest and he'd look for signs of Bigfoot. He really knew that he needed to provide concrete proof before the rest of the world would accept the fact that Bigfoot was real. So he would go and he'd look at the footprints, he'd see whether or not they matched up to what he understood about anthropology... He would talk to eyewitnesses and hear what their stories were. And he was just trying to be very thorough and logical about how he went through this process. And while people might have questioned his sanity a little bit as he looked into this, there was also a fair amount of respect, too, for how methodical he was trying to be about looking for Bigfoot. Uh, Laura, uh, what do you recommend for our investigation based on what you've learned from your personal research and Grover's research? The best thing you can do is go into this with an open mind, with the idea that Bigfoot might be real. Bigfoot might not be real, 
but you have to see where the evidence takes you. Is there any evidence in looking at the footprints or hearing people's eyewitness stories? What sorts of samples have been sent to laboratories? Those kinds of things are the evidence that will be coming into you guys, and you can analyze that and see if it stands up to scientific scrutiny. I think that's the most important part. But I think there is a lot out there in the world that we don't really understand right now. Science is changing constantly. Like, think about how 200 years ago, we didn't think that germs or viruses existed. And now, we're pretty sure that viruses exist. Yeah, pretty sure they're real. Right? You know, things change, and we learn more, and then we ask questions. And sometimes some of those questions that we ask seem completely crazy at the time, but turn out to be really spot on and really useful. So I think there is something to be said for asking questions and looking for more information and not automatically saying, no, there's no way that that could ever exist. But at the same time, you can't wish that it exists and then consider that to be enough. I think the phrase I've heard is, you have to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out. Thanks, Laura. So we need to keep an open mind, but be scientific about it. I mean, her cousin Gopher Krantz believed in him, so there has to be something there. He has to be real. I don't know if that's really true. Well, what do other scientists say? Let's chat with our science teacher, Mr. T, a naturalist and educator, to see how we can apply a scientific method to this. We gave him a call to chat about it. Mr. T, what do you think about this? Well, you know, Aster, I gotta say that when we look at this sort of thing like Bigfoot and other examples from a scientific point of view... You know, science is not one of those things that's belief-based, it's evidence-based. And what's great about science is that it's self-correcting. You see, if science is wrong, there's nobody there that's going to be saying, it's got to be this, we've always believed this. Science, once there's new evidence to support something, it corrects it. So you don't go with sort of ultimate truths unless you can really, truly disprove something. I like that theory because what I want to do is find evidence that is provable. Hmm. Mr. T, do you think that Bigfoot could be real? I'm not entirely skeptic of the idea of Bigfoot because we also haven't found evidence that says, no, it definitely doesn't exist. So if I back up for a second and we talk about the scientific process. So what that is, is when we have observed phenomena in the natural world, we try to find an explanation to explain why these phenomena work the way they do. And that can be absolutely anything as to why is the sky blue to why did that earthworm go into that hole? All these things that happen all around us every day have some sort of explanation as to why. Uh, so what science does is it tries to figure out those explanations. Now, Those explanations that we talk about when we're talking about the scientific method, we call those our theories. And theories are basically educated guesses that we create to be able to make explanations about the observations in the natural world. Now, the thing that's so important about science and that makes it different than belief uh, or blind faith is that you need to be able to test the theory or test the explanation and guesses uh, so that you can get evidence to either support the theory or disprove the theory. Now, in the case of our Bigfoot example, we haven't necessarily found yet positive evidence that says, yes, there is a Bigfoot or there was a Bigfoot. That being said, and we'll be talking about this another time, There is the possibility that there could have been some sort of human ancestor that we just haven't discovered the traces of yet. That's entirely possible. Really? That's awesome. That being said, scientifically speaking, until we find some evidence, like DNA evidence, can't necessarily say there is a Bigfoot yet either. So I'm on both sides of the fence right now until we get more information and can test that information. That's so cool that you say Bigfoot could possibly be a human ancestor. I think part of the reason why I believe in Bigfoot is because of a book that I read when I was younger. Mythical Monsters, Legendary Fearsome Creatures, which included a section about the Chupacabra. It's reported to have spikes, teeth, and overall just look like a complete monster. So many people have said that they've seen something like it. So, Zoe, in the case of the Chupacabra, I'm a bit more skeptical of its actual existence than I would be of the Bigfoot, simply because they figured out a lot of evidence to suggest that there is no Chupacabra. The Chupacabra literally translates to goat sucker, 
in its native Spanish, and it was reported back in 1995 after a number of sheep were found with holes in their neck. The reason they came up with this this idea of the chupacabra was that there were a number of sheep that were killed, and these sheep uh, had bite marks in their neck, and they suggested that they were bled like a vampire from the neck. So this kind of added credence to this uh, legend, this myth. And as it turns out, when uh, Mr. Radford went back, the sheep weren't actually bled out. They were just bitten around the neck, but never uh, they were never uh, eaten, frankly. So something could have happened that uh, an animal like a coyote or a canine species, animals that when they do hunt, they do grab the neck. And it can easily explain the bite marks on the neck as well. Uh, so more than likely what happened here is this was uh, a local predator that was hungry for a meal. And some predators will make their kills if there's a group of animals available to them. Some predators will grab one animal and carry it away to a safe place to eat. Other predators... Sometimes coyotes, uh, there are a few other animals that do this as well. They will attack their prey and then attack anything around it, figuring that they can always come back for it later. Oh, my goodness. Uh, So this does happen. Uh, The other thing that goes sort of against this that they found out was that people who have been reporting the ideas are getting pictures of things that they think are chupacabra, which happened down in the Carolinas. Uh, What they're actually seeing is a coyote with mange. It's this horrible mite, uh, this parasitic creature that causes all the fur of the animal to come off. And it really does make them look somewhat reptilian or alien-like. It would also explain why they wouldn't have eaten their food right away because they might not have been strong enough, frankly, to get into there and uh, get what they needed from their prey. So really, if you look deeper into the whole chupacabra thing, it's it's one of those that is far more likely to be untrue simply because it's a more modern myth and everything has pretty much been explained away very easily. I get what you're saying about the chupacabra, but what about Bigfoot? Like I talked about before, Bigfoot, Bigfoot's a little tricky. We still don't have that hard evidence, but we also don't have hard evidence to say definitely no, as we do with that chupacabra example. So um, what would be reliable Bigfoot evidence? Okay, so this is actually a great question, because what that brings us to is that discussion we had about the scientific process. Now, evidence is what we're talking about here, and evidence needs to be tested. Now, when you're testing that evidence, you can only test as much as you're able to do with, say, the technology that you have. Now, real scientific evidence can be tested, whereas people's stories, uh, you can't test those. It's just a belief. Now, I'm not saying that people are liars. People see things all the time. And so I would never suggest to someone, no, you're making that up, although sadly that does happen. But there are biases, is what we call them, with people's stories and what they see. There's a human psychology element to this. When you see something that you don't understand, your brain, if you will fill in the blanks for you, especially if you're feeling fear or depending upon your emotions. So if you see something big out in the woods, most likely you're naturally going to be scared. That is a natural instinct, a survival instinct. The problem is when you're telling this story later, your brain is going to make that thing bigger and justify the feelings that you're having about it. So when somebody sees uh, some large creature, a, a bear, a mountain lion, something like something with mange that they can't understand, their brain can create an actual picture for them. Do you think that there's anything possible like this, like with people with bears um, mistaking them for Bigfoot? Do you think there's anything possible like that, like mistaking a bobcat for a mountain lion? So what you're bringing up is a really great example, Esther, because I live here in Connecticut and we've sort of had our own little Bigfoot type thing in the natural world here. There's groups of people that have sworn that they've seen mountain lions and that mountain lions exist in Connecticut. Now, they haven't existed here as a population for a very long time. There's been no hard evidence of them. They haven't found scat, which is, of course, their 
you know, fecal remains. You mean poop. So they haven't found that, which they could do DNA testing on. But here's the interesting point. A few years ago, well, they found one. Whoa, that's crazy they found one. And so folks were up in arms saying, I told you the conspiracy was true. We now have hard evidence. What is it turns out it was a single solitary mountain lion. It was amazingly this mountain lion went on what the Australians would call a walkabout. I mean, it just made its way for thousands of miles and they actually found out that they had been tracking this thing through Wisconsin and other states. The scientists were able to take this DNA and they were able to trace it back to those mountain lions that lived all the way halfway across the country. So still not the case, still no populations that we found. So we'll get into the whole DNA aspect of the potential for a Bigfoot when we look in future episodes about how there were certain migrations of people into the Americas and how there's actually still a lot of scientific uncertainty regarding when people first, in fact, came over. So we can get more into the possibility of where could a Bigfoot have come from and is it human or is it some other kind of evolutionary line of people? I, I don't think we're ever going to find a real Bigfoot. But if Mr. T believes there's a chance and he's a man of science, it could be true. I don't believe there's a Bigfoot walking around, but evolution is such a good thing to bring up. I mean, who knows? Maybe there is some giant ape that we don't know about yet. That's what Dr. Kranz thought. I guess that's true. The only way to know is to be scientific about it. And research things. We gotta explore and try to find him ourselves on this journey. And I've got so many questions. Could she be real? Is it a living species? Is it a descendant? What about all those blurry images? I mean, what do we do if we catch one? I'd say number one, run, and number two, hide. If they're not real though, well, why does the myth persist? Why do we want to believe? So, in the upcoming episodes of Searching for Wild Thing, we're going to interview scientists who have expertise in evolution. So some people believe Bigfoot is a long-surviving remnant of a species that was called Gigantopithecus from Asia. And talk to businesses who use Sasquatch to sell their goods. Somebody owns a national trademark for coffee for using the term Bigfoot. So I switched it to the Sasquatch Coffee Company. Yeah, Sasquatch Coffee, have you tried it yet? And join Bigfoot seekers on an expedition in the wilderness. I don't want to freak anybody out. No. But it literally looks like something standing behind a tree with a shoulder and a head. We'll go through evidence and research things, like DNA tests. Talk to loads of eyewitnesses and explore why we want to believe. And why even the non-believers like me are fascinated. What does all of this say about Bigfoot? And what does it say about us? All the while keeping the core of our search science-based. And we'll check in with our brother and sister friends Sawyer and Noriel at the end of each show to see how we're doing. Noriel is a big believer, and by the time this podcast is over, she's going to be on my side. And Sawyer's a skeptic, but he's definitely going to be a believer like me at the end. Hmm, we'll see about that. In the end, we might not actually find Bigfoot himself. But I promise we're going to try. Ready to explore, Aster? Definitely. Let's do this. Thanks, Zoe and Aster. I'm Noriel. And I'm Sawyer. Before I listened to the podcast, I did believe in Bigfoot. I've always been a believer ever since I was little. I've never really believed in Bigfoot, and the podcast was backing up my evidence, so I still think Bigfoot is fake, and all those are just tales. To prove Bigfoot is real, you need hard evidence. Yeah, but for me, a footprint is enough evidence. Yes, but you don't know if that's Bigfoot's footprint, a fake footprint. You don't have the source of what the footprint is from. The source is Bigfoot. (sighs) Many people thought the chupacabra was real, but scientists proved this wrong. And that's probably going to happen with Bigfoot. Mr. T said, as in the state of Connecticut, mountain lions are not present. And eventually they found a mountain lion. I mean, what if Bigfoot is like this mountain lion and there's just one of him? Bigfoot could have migrated thousands of miles, but what does that prove? (laughs) <laughs> it proves that, that he could be real. But it doesn't. Hmm. We'll see. I'm excited for the next episode. That was the first episode of Searching for Wild Thing, a kid-friendly version of Wild Thing. To hear the rest of the season, go to pinna.fm to sign up for a subscription.